As we look at our final sermon in the series, I am second. We would be remiss if we didn't, I don't think, sing the song Amazing Grace. We can't understand things if we don't understand what this amazing grace is. We can't understand the glorious joy that comes in serving a living, risen Savior if we don't understand amazing grace. We can't understand the point of living if we don't understand the love and the grace that came with Jesus died. We're going to look today at the topic of the glorious wedding. And we're going to look today about how our role in serving a risen Savior is second by design. And we're going to try to wrap up all this stuff we've talked about for the last five weeks in a tremendous celebration. That's what weddings are, aren't they? You go, there's excitement, there's food, there's dancing, there's fun. But there's one thing that stands out above the rest. The radiant bride that walks down the aisle. And I always laugh at wedding rehearsals and I tell the grooms to be, just stand there and don't mess up. <laughs> this is really about the bride. And when we look at our lives, when we look at an understanding of faith and how it comes together, I hope that in the end we'll see how that same thing happens in our faith with Jesus Christ. But at the beginning, we have to understand who Jesus is. And somebody to talk to you about this, maybe a little bit more impactful than I am, is a guy by the name of Plata. I think it's, the, it's a defining question for a Christian, is who was Christ. And, and I don't think you're let off easily by saying a great thinker or a great philosopher. I mean, because actually, he went back saying he was the Messiah. That's why he was crucified. He was crucified because he said he was the Son of God. So he either, in my view, was the Son of God or he was not. No, no, not. not. Yes. Forget yes. rock and roll messianic complexes. This is like, I mean, Charlie Manson type delirium. And I find it hard to accept that all oh, millions and millions of lives, half the earth for 2,000 years, have been touched, have felt their lives touched and inspired by some nutter. I just, I don't believe it. And so think, therefore it follows that you believe he was divine. Yes. And therefore it follows that you believe that he rose physically from the dead. Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, no problem with miracles. <laughs> I'm one. So, so when you pray, then you pray to Jesus. Yes, the risen Jesus. Yes, and you believe that He made promises which will come true. Yes, I do. You like following me? Our scripture today comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter three, starting in verse twelve. This is what it's written. Not that I have already obtained all of this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Dear Father, as we come this morning to understand your will for us. As we come, Father, one last time to look at ourselves being second to your work and to your mission in life. As we spend a few more moments, Father, looking at ourselves being second to the tremendous gift you gave us in salvation. Father, as we look at these words today, as we study your scriptures, as we look at what we have been given to follow, help us to understand our place, our position, our work. To glorify you in your name we pray. Amen. So the first question today is this. Have we accepted the person of Jesus Christ? I came across this video from Mono a couple years ago, and I thought it was interesting to hear somebody else explain the work and the worship of Jesus Christ in their lives. We oftentimes look at stars, we 
look at other Christians, we look at people, and we assume there's an understanding of who Jesus is. But the whole point of this interview was to make Bono question who Jesus was. And I think there's a couple of things that stand out in that. One Bono says, well, I believe it 100% he had to be. Who else would go around in the face of crucifixion saying, yes, I am the Son of God, if they weren't? Bono says, I believe 100% what he said. I believe the information that he gave us in that time in those discussions. I think the second part that stands out for me in this video is an understanding of Bono believing in miracles. And if we believe in the work and the worship of Jesus Christ, we have to believe in His ability to make radical transformation in our lives through His work, through salvation in Him. I don't know if you caught it, Bono's accent sometimes a little hard to understand. But he said in there, do you believe in miracles? He said, yes. He said, I live around them. And he said, quietly, I am one. See, we come to understand today, when we talk about the glorious wedding, when we talk about the transformation in our lives, an understanding of being second to a God that is always first because he's the king, we have to understand that principle first. We have to understand God's miraculous transformation in life because we, us, you sitting here, are an example of that in your daily lives. So who is Jesus Christ? He's the living Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary, preached, taught, shared, performed miracles for 33 years. He was crucified, he was dead and buried of no account for no reason other than they did not like him. He died three days in the grave, rose again. It is in that time, in that miracle that we celebrate as Easter, that we come to know the person of Jesus Christ and need to understand the miracle of transformation that happens and our ability to be saved from our sins and brought to salvation in Jesus Christ. So we have to understand that. We have to understand on the very foundation who Jesus Christ is. Not was, is. We have to understand that to understand our role as being second in life. So Paul comes to us in his letter. In 1 Corinthians 3 he says, Having not yet grasped all of these things. I think as we start, we understand the work and the worship of Jesus Christ. We have to in some ways admit that we don't understand everything that Jesus does. In our minds as human beings, I don't think we can understand everything that Jesus Christ does. The work and the worship of God oftentimes can be mysterious. And it can be challenging to grasp from a scientific or proven perspective. And Paul comes to us and the Apostle Paul, the man who was met on the road to Damascus, put on his knees and whined when Jesus Christ said, So why do you persecute me? If he says in his life and ministry, I haven't yet grasped all of these things, then why should we think any different? I bring this up at the beginning because we don't have to understand every single thing that happens to be fully devoted to following a life in Jesus Christ and being his disciples. Paul furthers that by the end of this scripture saying, Not yet having attained it, I press on towards the goal, which is calling me heavenward in Jesus Christ. Friends, that is why we are here, to press on towards that goal. Not to grasp everything in 100% understanding. That will only happen when we make it to heaven and we understand that spiritual connectedness in salvation. So we have to understand where God is calling us in our lives to get there. So we look at our next scripture today from the book of Ephesians. And it's going to explain where we're coming from today in our, in our understanding of the glorious wedding. Paul writes this, Wives, submit to yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as the radiant church, without stain, 
or wrinkle or other blemish, but holy and blameless. So we look at this today, and I think it's important to understand this synonym that Paul puts together for us in the church to understand how we come to Jesus Christ. We look at it as a marriage. And we look at it as a two-part thing. There has to be a head, there has to be a decision maker, and there has to be a person that works with that in support and love and hope. So we look at this today and we come to an understanding of the glorious wedding. We have two parties. We have a husband who is recognized as the head of the household. We have a bride who comes, and as I said at the beginning, the bride is the show of the wedding. Dressed in white, done up, stands out. When we look at an understanding of how a household works, we look at this example, this teaching of what Paul gives us in the book of Ephesians. And we need to understand, this is how the church should operate with Christ. The first thing is this, we as the church need to be submissive to Christ's commands. And that's not easy. When we've talked about this whole time for the past six weeks about being second, if I asked you how many of you were good at just following commands without pushing back, my guess would be many of us would not raise our hands. We don't always like to submit without getting our opinion in. How many of you have children that when you say, go clean your room, say, okay. <laughs> if you have some, we'd appreciate tips at our house as to how to make that work. How many of you at work when your boss comes and says you're going to do this now, this way, look at him and go, sounds good to me? Most of us probably don't. Most of us as kids or with kids growing up and that example said, I don't want to clean my room. Or I'm not doing it now. Or maybe later. I'll do it tomorrow. Right? At work we get told how to do things, when to do things. Oftentimes we look at them and say, that's not the right way to do it. Or I could have done it better if you let me do it my way. Or maybe we should do it a different way, because I know what I'm doing. So we have to submit. We have to be submissive to Christ's commands in our lives. But there's a good reason for this. And it's the reason we need to read the second part of what Ephesians said. We need to submit to Jesus Christ because He is the head of the church. As the head of the church, He gave up everything, including His life, that the church, the bride, the radiant bride, may be brought forward holy and blameless, pure and cleansed. Friends, the, the bringing this together, the understanding why we come second, why we put God first, is because without Jesus Christ, without God, we don't exist in the form we are. Without the redemption power of Jesus Christ and the blood of the cross, we are hopeless. We have to understand that is what happened when the new gospel come, when the, when the new covenant, the covenant of Jesus Christ happened, we were brought into freedom through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Before that, there was no way. So we have to understand that when we come, when we say we need to be second, when we need to submit, when we need to get on our knees and lift our lives up to Christ, we are doing it because Christ gave in a measurable amount for us. To present us pure, holy, blameless, radiant, Jesus Christ died. That is why we have to be submissive. It's not a punishment. It's a respect. It's not something we do because we're being pushed down. It's something we do because we are lifting up the God that gave everything for us. So as we come before God, Peter writes this in 2 Peter. So I always remind you of these things. Even though you know them as firmly established in the truth you now have, I think it is right to refresh your memory, as long as I live in the tent of his body. Because I know that I will soon be put aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ made it clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. So I will remind you of these things. Friends, we... We teach these things, we preach these things, we pray these things, we read our scriptures, we come to church, we go to Bible study, we meet in small groups, we pray around our tables as families to remind ourselves of these things. 
How hard is it every day to get up and remember that we are born again Christians? I would like to say it's easy. But I would also know that we all have obligations in life that sometimes challenge our faith and things are happening. Maybe it's a health concern. Maybe we have a family member that is, is in extremely poor health. Maybe it's a family concern. Our family's not doing well. There's challenges, addictions, financials, house problems, whatever they may be. Maybe it's a personal issue we have at work. We're in a job that we hate, that we can't stand, that we get there and every day we look down on our lives because we don't like it. We need to be reminded of what Christ did for us. We need to be reminded that we are the radiant bride that was bought at a price, the price of Christ's life to be holy and blameless and pure. Peter knew this. He wrote to the church. He said, I know that you're going to forget these things, and it is my right to remind you every single day who you were. You are set aside. You are holy. You are blameless. You were bought at the most immense price ever, the life of the Son of the living God. Friends, we our blocks. When we talk today about the glorious wedding, we should rise up and we should shout from the mountaintops when we leave this place that we are the daughters and the sons, the bride of the living God. And because of that, nothing can beat us up. I don't know about you, but when I do go to weddings and I see them, I rarely see a bride that's not having a good day. Right? They're always happy. Brides are ecstatic. It's their day. For you young ladies that grew up, you started planning your wedding when you were a small girl. And I believe that probably every one of you planned the fairy tale wedding. You were going to ride in on a horse carriage on white horses. You were going to be escorted up an aisle with rose petals and, and fine linens. And you were going to stand before a group looking absolutely spectacular with nothing that could bring you down. And as the celebration goes on, Brides are beaming at their weddings. Friends, that's what we should be every day because we are a part of that in the kingdom of heaven. We are the bride of a living God. For that reason, nothing can bring us down, nothing can beat us up, nothing can push us aside. So we come to understand that. We come to understand that we are a Mr. and a Mrs. We come in this understanding. John writes this, again, Jesus said, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them instead, receive the Holy Spirit. Friends, when we became Mr. and Mrs., when we became this relationship, when we said at some point in time in our lives, Jesus Christ, I want you to be Lord and Savior of my soul, of my life, in the context of it, we looked at Jesus when God said, do you? And we said, I do. And Jesus looked at us and said, I do as well. And because Jesus said, I do, there is nothing we can do that makes us say, I don't. God has wrapped his hands around us, and he is lifting up, and he is carrying us. Brother, we accept Jesus Christ. When that marriage comes together, when we are bonded to him, he breathes into us and says, receive the Holy Spirit. That is what guides us. That is what fuels us. That is what speaks to us. That is what challenges us. And I encourage each of us today, as we go through this place, to understand our role as being second. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, Discipleship is not an offer that man makes to Christ. What does that mean? Well, in summary of our series, discipleship is something that God calls to us to be. It is something that Jesus Christ comes to us and says, Please come to me. I want you to be my child. I want you to do well. I want you to live well. I want you to prosper. I want you to have a good life. I want you to be raised up in the purity and the love of Jesus Christ's sacrifice for us. Friends, we are second. We have to understand that in a way that brings us together. When we ask and we understand what it is, it goes a lot like this. Chuck and Lucy. Tell me what love is, Chuck. And Charlie Brown replies, a man named Jesus. Friends, we're called to be second. Not because God's this omnipotent, jealous person that just wants to put us down. But quite the opposite. 
God's an omnipotent, loving God that wants to lift us up. And to lift us up, He sent the ultimate sacrifice that we may be the radiant one. He sent His Son. He sent His Son to die for us. He sent His Son to raise back up. So that all who call on His name, all that come before the Son of God and bow and say, I want you to be my God, are cleansed and made pure. Friends, why do we celebrate Jesus Christ? Why do we go out and endeavor to share His mission and His love? Why do we put Him first above our own needs? Because before we did anything, Jesus Christ put Himself on the cross that we may be saved. Friends, today when you ask the question, who are we, what are we? We are the bride of the living God. Brought before Him pure and holy, made blameless in His blood. Today as you go from this place, lift that up, shine bright. Walk down the aisle of life, beaming from ear to ear, and when people say, why are you happy? Say, I've got Jesus Christ in my heart. Would you like to talk about it? And see the opportunities that come before you. Friends, what is love? Love is a man named Jesus Christ who came and gave all that we may live. Let us pray. Dear Father, we come before you this morning and pray that you'll be with us, that you will guide us. The Father, as we understand being second to you, the Father, we understand it in the way that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. The Father, we're second because you gave so much for us that we want to lift you up. The Father, we're second because you love us so much that it encourages us to teach you, to share you, to give others the, lift, the gift of hope, of peace, and of grace that comes in knowing the joy that you gave before us. Father, why are we here? We're here because of amazing grace. Father, help us to be second. Second to you. That in all we do, who we are, our conversations, our actions, our lives, are lived to lift you up and to glorify you for what you gave us. In your name we pray.